Hey girls, and welcome to another bonus episode of the Hey Girl podcast. This episode, we are releasing our second main session. This is the last session of the day and kind of wraps up the story I spoke from um, Second Chronicles, and I really hope you enjoyed the first session. This next one, we kind of continue on. It's a wrap-up of the day. Again, Simply Beautiful that happened this November. And I just really, again, pray that this is an encouragement to you and um, maybe just helps hold you over until we launch again in January. Thanks again, all of you, for listening. We love you. We could not do this without you. And so until January, as wherever you are running your race in your place, I pray that this episode, this session from Simply Beautiful is an encouragement to you. I just need you all to know something right off the bat, because some of you after this morning's story may be like, I don't really know if you actually went whitewater rafting. So I brought photo evidence that I did get in the boat. I'm the front, it's kind of the crotch shot, sorry. Um, <laughs> the, the blue shorts strategically covering and the, that's me. That's my excited face. <laughs> Yay, I'm not dead yet. <sighs> that's right, I, uh, I got in the raft Uh, followed the guide, went down that river. And I want to say that the moment I got in the raft, like after I took that step, I tucked my toes into that balloon, that I was just a natural born rafter. That it was like, guys, I'm so good. But that's actually not true. And we're in a church, so I can't lie and tell you that story. But I'll tell you what actually happened, which is that first of all, My fear did not go away just because I chose to step in the boat. So much so that my, have you ever had those toe cramps? I had been so, the first leg, I had tucked my toes so tight and was so like nervous that my feet, when we got through the first rapids and you kind of relaxed for a minute, I was like, ha! (laughs) Like I had just cramped up my feet because I was just so determined that I was not going to fall out of this boat. And here's the thing about whitewater rafting. It actually is very counterintuitive. And what I mean is the entire trip down the river, I had to listen to the guide and like resolve and choose to do what he was telling me to do because my fear in the moment, like what my body, what my heart was telling me to do in those moments was not what he was telling me to do. And so we would be going down the river, toes tucked, leaning out, Wah! and we're rowing, right? And then we, you see the rapids coming and your heart like speeds up. And like, this is not like roller coaster thrill. In a roller coaster, you're like, I'm strapped in. Like, yeah, like 1% of roller coasters crash. Okay, it's probably not gonna be this one, I'll be fine. But in this, you're like, my toes are my lifeline and I am leaning out of the boat. And, And the guide is literally like, okay, I want everyone just wait until I tell you. And then when I say go, I need you to dig deep. That's what they call like, you gotta get in there and just row as hard as you can, row, row. And so I'm like, okay, toes, butt, tight. Okay, and we're rowing. And so I'm like holding, waiting, and I can see like the water. And here's the thing, like you almost feel like you need to do that for balance. Like, okay, I'm ready. Like we need to dig. He's like, no, no, wait. And the whole, I'm like, I just want to row. I don't want to wait. Let's go. Because just everything's building up. And finally, you hit a rapid. Now this is the moment that he's like, now row. But my heart is saying, grab the rope. (laughs) Because that is not the moment that you're like, I wanna lean a little further out and start rowing. That is the moment when the boat is going into the air and you just want to grab the safety line because you're like, I'm definitely going to die in this moment. And that is the entire ride. You should definitely try white water rafting. 
But literally, there were moments, I still remember, when we're going down the river, and here's the thing about this particular river, is it's not like it's, you know, level five rapids the whole way. It's like you hit real serious rapids, and then you get to catch your breath for a minute. And then you hit another series of rapids, so you see them coming. So it's like this anticipation, and I'm, look, I'm looking ahead, and I have it in my mind, it looks a little nicer on the right side, and that looks like death. So I say we row that way, and in that moment, he's like, we're going, we're going to the left. We have to go to the left. And I was like, I literally questioned him at this point, because clearly he was losing it, and I was like, um, by left you mean right. No, by left I mean left. Okay, your left or my left? Which way are you looking? Because I think we're going my right, but you're saying left. No, we're going everybody's left, to the left. And I was like, I'm not sure if you're seeing this clearly. Those are really big rapids. That looks a little easier. But no, he's like, I need you to trust me, everybody, to the left. And so we're rowing, and we're rowing, and we go through these crazy rapids, but we get to the other side. And I kid you not, the boat behind us decides, oh no, we're going to the right. And we got to watch, which is not always the case. This boat, in what seemed like calm rapids, come up and all of a sudden it looked like a sinkhole just grabbed their boat and they went, like disappeared and then popped up with half the raft. <laughs> they were fine, they had like jackets. But it was like, and I don't know what it was called, but somehow this guy knew the river so well that he's like, I need you to trust me. I know it looks better, but actually if we go that way, it's going to suck you in <laughs> and you will die. <laughs> he could have just said that, but he didn't. He's just like, trust me, we're going left. And we went through. So here's the thing I was sharing this morning about this idea of like, it didn't matter how much faith or the idea of like getting rid of my fear to get in the boat. It mattered where I placed it. And so here I had decided to get on the boat that I'm like, okay, I got this guide. He knows the way. He's done it a million times. He's already bragging about the fact that he can do it alone and he doesn't need us. So I need to trust him. But it wasn't actually enough for me to just say, okay, I trust you. Okay. I actually had to do what he said. Like there was the waiting, right? And we're like, okay, here we go. But then when he spoke, it was time for me to do something about it. It was like where I took my faith and I actually kind of proved it to be what I said it was. Because if that entire time I was looking at him and I was like, I trust you, man. I trust you. No, we going right. I don't care what you say. We going right. Like, and he's like, okay, but you're, you're not actually trusting me. You're just saying that you trust me. And it got me thinking about this verse in James chapter 2. I want to read you just a few verses. It said this. What good is it, my brothers or my sisters, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, eat well, but you don't actually give them what their body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. Girls, for all of us here, as we talk about this idea, we've been talking about this little mustard seed of faith, that that's all God needs, and he can move mountains. But faith isn't just lip service. It's not just a good thing to say, I put my faith in God. It actually should, if it's real faith, produce an action. There should be something that comes out of that, right? In fact, I would argue to say that all of us, we put our faith somewhere. Even if you don't put it in God, you put it somewhere. In that moment, if I had decided, forget it, I'm rowing right, you're a nut job, okay? Then in that moment, I could have said till I was blue in the face, God, I trust you. But everything that I would be doing would be saying, but really I trust myself more. <laughs> right? But how often do we do this with God? 
God, I trust you. And when he asks us to do things, now here's the thing. I think there are like two kinds of things that God asks us to do. This is going to revolutionize your life. You should probably write this down. There's the easy things, and then there's the hard things. I'll give you a moment to finish. There's the easy asks when we go, we seek after God, and he leads us to do something that, to be perfectly honest, we're fine with doing. Like 15 years ago, when God led me to marry the most gorgeous man on the planet who loved Jesus with all of his heart, I was like, yes, Jesus. (laughs) I didn't even wait on it. (laughs) I scooped him up and ran, okay? That was an easy obedience. You didn't have to convince me, okay? But that's not all that God asks us to do. Sometimes God asks us to do things that are not only scary or hard, but they're risky and they require sacrifice. And those are the moments. Those are the moments when we take our words of faith and our words of worship to God and everything we described in that story this morning of worshiping God, you are great, and we wait. And we actually get to basically... Um, put our money where our mouth is. Have you ever heard this term? Like, it's not all talk anymore. Like, let's actually see what, what is happening. Is this real faith? And I'm telling you, your words can say one thing, but your actions are really revealing what is actually going on. Like, yes, I trust you, God. I'm just not going to do what you say. It doesn't work that way, Right? I want to take us back to the story of Jehoshaphat. We're actually going to read the second half of this story. And we're picking up. We left, right? He Earlier today, the armies were coming in, right? He was afraid. He resolved to seek after God. He fasted. He prayed. He remembered. He worshiped. He waited. And now we're going to pick up the story. In all of that being done, God finally speaks. Are you ready for this? And he said, listen carefully, all Judah, this is God speaking, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. You will see them coming up the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley facing the wilderness of Jeruel. You do not have to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. He is with you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid or discouraged. Tomorrow, go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. All this time, Jehoshaphat, all they're waiting for God to speak. And then finally in this moment, he speaks. And I want you to get a picture of this for a minute. Because this all began with the armies are coming in. Jehoshaphat's terrified. He's waiting for God to speak. And this is what God says. Okay, now this is what I want you to do. Tomorrow, start going towards the men that are here to kill you. Let's shorten the distance a little. March that way, okay? But here's the thing. I actually don't want you to fight them, okay? You're not going to fight them. What you're going to do is you're going to move towards them. You're going to stand in this place, stand still in this place, and you're going to watch me do my thing. I'm sorry, but can you imagine being the king It's a good thing that God said this in front of the whole assembly. Can you imagine if he had just said it to Jehoshaphat and he has to relay that? So, uh, guys, here's the deal. I know we were probably thinking God was going to give us a secret exit out of here, but he actually said we need to walk towards the men with guns. Okay? It's crazy. And how many times in our life, after we've waited and we've waited and we've waited on God, he speaks... And the thing, whatever it is that he asks us to do, we're tempted to be like, I'm sorry, come again? (laughs) Like, uh, no, you said, you said left, but you meant right, right, God? Like, there's no way. The 
that you really want me to walk towards these guys and not do anything. Like, I get, okay, guys, walk towards the bad guys, and I'm going to give you the army, and you're going to trample them and take them all out. No. He's like, you're going to walk there, and you're actually, I don't want you to do anything. I can't even imagine being, it's like totally out of control. Okay, we're, mar- we're marching. This is his moment. Today's the day I'm going to die. Here we go. <laughs> like, come on, y'all. We're going down. I want you to hear what happens after this. It's absolutely amazing. In the morning, they got up early and went out of the wilderness to Tekoa. As they were about to go out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. Then he consulted with the people and appointed some to sing for the Lord and some to praise the splendor of his holiness. And when they went out front of the armed forces, they kept singing, give thanks to the Lord and his faithful love endures forever. I just, we have to pause for a minute. He's been, you can't stop this guy from worshiping now. He's like, okay, now God has said, go march towards the guys that are going to kill you. And what's Jehoshaphat? Okay, we're going. And you know who's going to lead the way? The worship leaders. We are not just going to go. We are going to sing praises to God the entire way. The only thing that I can, that makes me think about what this might have looked like was this time I was in Mexico and all good stories start with that one time I was in Mexico. <laughs> but I was in Mexico, and I'd been leading this missions trip, and a bunch of the youth wanted to go on their day off and take this trip to something called La Bufadora. Okay? Don't ask. Um, but La Bufadora is really a tourist trap, but the thing about it is it's way out on the end of this peninsula, And you have to drive, like there's no, technically you can like see where it is from where we were staying, but it takes forever to get there because you have to drive this winding road all along like the ocean is here. But here's the thing. It's not like drive the beautiful, like what is it, Route 1, whatever in California. You're like, oh, look at the ocean. No, it's like, oh, look at the cliff. And it's Mexico. So it's not like there's guardrails or really any road rules whatsoever. Neither had they really considered what if two cars have to go at the same time? Maybe one this way, maybe one that way. It is like barely enough space. And I had a lot of teenagers, which meant safety comes first, thus a 13-passenger van, terrified. (laughs) Absolutely terrifying. And I had to drive. So I am behind the wheel of this 13-passenger van driving to La Bufadora. And as we come up on this peninsula, and the cliff gets higher and higher, and I mean it is so high, you don't even see the ground (laughs) when you look. You just see the drop to the ocean. And I'm pretty sure the teenagers in the van thought I was kidding, but I just started singing. (laughs) Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tell. It's all I could do. Because at that moment, like, you want to talk about fear gripping you? And they're like, hi, oh, you're so funny. I was like, no, everybody sing praises. Here we go. And again, not that I would not that I wasn't afraid, but I was like, Jesus, take the wheel. Like, we're on a cliff. And it was absolutely terrifying. But I just sang, I literally sang myself to La Bufadora. We survived, in case you didn't make that connection. <laughs> Everyone survived. But I picture King Jehoshaphat and all of these people marching forward. And I almost imagine that scene. Not that he had suddenly been like, nothing can happen, right? Because God didn't necessarily specify, hey, don't worry about it. I'm going to kill them all. He said, I want you to watch what I'm going to do. But I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do. So here's King Jehoshaphat. Jesus loves me, this I know for the... Come on, God! like and it's like this resolve and this decision God I am going to obey you even if it's scary even if I don't understand 
we're moving forward. Listen to where it goes from here. The moment they began their shouts and praises, the Lord set an ambush against the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Seir who came to fight against Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites turned against the inhabitants of Mount Seir and completely annihilated them. When they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy each other. When Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked towards the multitude, and there were corpses lying on the ground. Guys, don't miss this. Jehoshaphat, he is walking in faithful obedience to what God has asked him to do. He's singing praises as he marches. And we get to read this incredible scene, right? We're looking in. Here's this whole army is coming to get him. And God just intervenes and they turn on each other. They basically, the whole army kills each other. And everybody, I don't know how the last two, that's where my brain goes. I'm like, how did the last two die at the same time? Was it like both, like three, two, one? You said me, I said you. And then they're all dead? Like, because at one point it was one on one. But they were all dead. That's all scripture says. Everybody was dead. But you know what stood out to me more than anything when I read this? The verse right after it. When Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, Jehoshaphat didn't get to see that. God was working on behalf of Jehoshaphat while he was still marching, having no idea what was ahead of him, singing praises to God in faith that, God, I don't know what you're going to do. He wasn't worshiping because he was standing there watching God kill the armies. He hadn't seen it. But God was doing it. God was there destroying Jehoshaphat, having no idea, and still choosing to worship God. And then you get this amazing picture of they come up over this mountain. Can you imagine? Just stop for a minute and think about this. Five minutes ago, they thought, this is the day I'm going to die. And they know right over that crest, there are so many soldiers. We don't stand a chance. But God, we're worshiping. We're remembering. We're worshiping. We're believing. We're trusting. Having no idea what's going on. And then they come up over and they're all dead. Which sounds morbid. But when you're Jehoshaphat, that's amazing. Everybody's dead. All of these people. How did that even happen? That's incredible. Have you ever been in a place where you have asked God to move and you felt like nothing was happening? And then all of a sudden you had that moment of coming up over the rise and you got to see what God had been doing all along that you had no idea. Have you ever had one? First of all, in order to have that moment, you actually have to pray for things, put your faith in God for things, and then wait on him to do it. Otherwise, Jehoshaphat could have gotten that news and run for the hills. He could have gotten that news, resolved himself, fasted, prayed, gotten the word from the Lord, and been like, nope, too risky. All right, guys, we're out. He could have resolved himself, fasted, prayed, heard from God, Jehoshaphat go, and been so afraid and decided, nope, it's too risky, I'm too scared, and it's hopeless, and stayed put, and waited, always wondering, when is it going to happen? He could have missed the whole miracle, but instead, in that moment, he made this conscious decision. Okay, God, I don't know what's going to happen here. No idea. But God, here's the thing. It's not about how much faith, faith I have. Because you have said, if I have this tiny bit like a mustard seed, if I put my faith in you, you can move mountains. And God, I want to know the one who moves mountains. 
That's the one I want to be with. And God, I want this kind of faith that I would rather march into a losing battle with you, God, than run for safety without you. I would rather risk everything for you, God, to be with you and to know you than choose anything else. And you know the beauty of this story, the thing that struck me as I studied this, was this idea of worshiping God for who he was, not for what he had done. Because again, the king hadn't seen that. It wasn't a, sweet God, you did it. Let's all worship. God did his thing. It was, God, no matter what you do, you are great. And you are good. And you are God. And for those reasons... I will worship you. And God, I will trust you with everything. God, I will march into this battle. For some of you, maybe God's called you to do something that feels really risky. <laughs> that feels like, ah, uh, yeah, that's going to cost too much. I remember in school, really wrestling with this idea of, God, if I really walk in my faith, if I really choose you, I will literally have no friends. And I know that sounds sad and pathetic, but literally, when you're in high school, that matters. It mattered to me in high school. And I looked around my high school, and I'm like, none of these kids will still be my friends if I follow you. And God brought me to this place, and it was a tough journey for me in my teen years, but where I had gone down this path of basically like, God, I trust you, but then really going after every other thing and then coming out empty and being like, God, I just want you. And literally in a moment of desperation being like, and you know what, God, I'm willing to give it all up. I will give it all up if I can just have you. And I love those stories when people are like, I wanted to give it all, and then I came to God, and then I had, it was all these other friends, and I didn't know. That was not my story. My story was I followed Jesus, and I had no friends. <laughs> that was actually my story. I know, it sounds terribly depressing. But can I tell you something? Uh, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth, I'm a very slow learner. Tenth grade, okay, around tenth grade. I went after everything else. I, I said, God, I trust you. I put my faith in you. But I took my little mustard seed and I put it anywhere else. Because I knew, God, if I'm really all in, if I'm really not just saying that I trust you, but I'm actually going to do what you say, it's going to cost way too much. And I liked having friends. I'm a people person. I like people. And I like when people like me. I don't tend to like it when they don't like me. It's sad. It makes me cry. And this was this moment, and it sounds so trivial, but honestly, in middle school and high school, friendships are a big deal, and it was a big deal to me. And it wasn't until this absolute moment of desperation that I was finally willing, God, everything. I will give it all. And it was a rough season. It was hard as invitations to parties started slowing down, as friends stopped reaching out. And slowly I started to see people kind of distance because they're like, there's something different about you and it makes me uncomfortable. Like, I want to be able to do all the things we used to do and if you don't do it with me, then it makes everyone feel awkward. So we don't want you around. But can I tell you, my last part of my 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade year, when I had almost no friends, but this really hot boyfriend. <laughs> it's fine. I married him. <laughs> I had the most joy and peace and contentment than I ever had years before that. They were some of the scariest years for me. Going to school and having to face people again, like Jehoshaphat facing the army, where you're like, everybody's trying to kill me. Sometimes middle school feels that way. <laughs> They're going to kill me, okay? And it's, 
intimidating and walking through the halls of my school just choosing and resolving God I want to walk with you I would rather walk these halls with no friends and have you than have all these friends and not have you Girls, as we look back over this day, as we think about this story of Jehoshaphat, which is just, has quickly become one of my favorite stories. And we think about from the very beginning when they came in and they told Jehoshaphat, listen, the armies, they're coming in and they're close, okay? We don't have time. We're all going to die. And some of you have even shared today that you're kind of in that place in your life where, yeah, things are scary. They're scary right now. I'm facing things. I don't know what the answer is going to be. It seems like this big, hopeless thing. And we look at his life in that moment when he was afraid, not that he was not afraid, but that in that moment of fear, he resolved, he made the decision, God, I'm going to put my trust in you. I'm going to put my trust in you. And girls, we talked about this. Okay, let's make space. And I've heard you throughout the day talk about, yes, my life is noisy. And girls, that's not just you. That's your moms and me. Like, all of our lives, they're noisy. And if we're not intentional, it doesn't quiet down on its own. Like, sometimes we just have to choose it. Sometimes I have to hide my phone on myself just so that I don't touch it. Because if it's in my hand or in my pocket, I'm always, like... It's, it's reaction. I even have that phantom vibrate thing. Has anyone ever heard of that? When I don't have my phone on me, and I was like, oh, my butt's vibrating. I don't even have my phone. <laughs> Seems like a personal problem. <laughs> but, like, you have your phone so much, and you're so used to it, that you don't, like, it's almost like you're missing something. And it takes real intentionality for us to quiet that down, to create space for God to speak. But Jehoshaphat did that. And in that time, he remembered the great things that God had done. He worshipped God for who he was. And then he waited. And girls, all day we've talked about this idea of waiting. And a lot of you in this room are in that place of waiting. And it's uncomfortable and it's not natural. And sometimes you might be like me and you're like, I'm not even doing it well. I'm the one that's always, ah, like I freak out and I don't want to. I know I shouldn't, but then I do because you don't know until that moment when you know the thing that courses through you as you're falling and just something happens and you're like, I just, like you want control. I got to do something as though sticking your butt out is going to save you. And it's so hard because we hate to wait. God, just show me, give me a sign. Send me a neon angel, something. And God just whispers, just wait. But then the end of the story, this is the part that blows my mind. He spent all this time, he's worshipped, he's waited, he's remembered. And then God comes with this word that seems just kind of dumb. (laughs) Like, practically speaking, if there are people after you to kill you, don't walk towards them. Oprah would tell you to weave and run. I learned that, okay? (laughs) But you don't walk towards them. That makes no sense. And yet God goes to Jehoshaphat. He's like, that's exactly what I want you to do. I want you to walk towards the thing you're terrified of. Yeah, who does that? People that get in rafts, okay? And not only do I want you to walk towards the thing that you're terrified of, but I don't want you to do anything to fight them. Are you kidding me right now? Yeah, like, I want, I want to do something. And God's like, no, this is, this is all I want you to do. I want you to go forward to this place, and I want you to stand still, and I want you to see what I'm going to do. In that beautiful picture of Jehoshaphat worshiping as he walked, not knowing what was going to be over the crest of that hill. And girls, today, I stand before you as somebody who's in, in that place in my life where I feel like 
I'm waiting. I feel like I'm walking kind of like in this place of, I don't know what's ahead of me. Jesus loves me. This Like that moment, okay? And it's a scary moment to be in. And this whole day, if it was not for you, was probably just for me to hear this message out of my own mouth, which is really obnoxious. Because I need more than ever to remember that in these days when I feel like my faith is weak and God, I'm just, I'm the worst waiter. I'm always just sticking my butt out when I get nervous and I want to like cling to something. And the guy says row and I want to grab the rope and do the complete opposite. God, it's scary. I don't want to do it. And then God whispers, God, I don't need you to have this great faith. If you And if it's like this tiny, small as a mustard seed, Bethany, if you give it to me, I can move mountains. Girls, God can move your mountains, not just mine. No matter how scary, no matter how big, but he needs you to place that faith in him. And not just with your words, but with your obedience to walk in believing that God is good, that he can do incredible things to not just hear what God says, but then to go and do. I want to have that faith. I want to have that faith that would rather walk into a losing fight than to run for safety without my God. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you so much. I thank you for this whole day, God, for the beauty of just being here, of seeing all of these women and these girls, worshiping you, learning from you. God, these women who have been teaching all day and using their gifts, God, to just bless these women and these moms. I am just in awe, God, of everything that you have done the work that you're continuing to do, God, I confess that I, I wrestle with faith. I wrestle in those moments of just wanting, wanting to grab control or, or just do something less risky. God, but I'm so grateful for you who continues to call me back to yourself, who continues to walk with me. Even when I don't know where we're headed, God, I'm grateful to be walking with you. I love you. We're so grateful that you love us and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.